lucky today to have Dr. Jorge Reyes with us. Dr. Reyes performed his transplant fellowship in Pittsburgh during the heyday of Pittsburgh's liver volume when they did about 500 liver transplants a year. You can imagine that. And he stayed in Pittsburgh for the next 15 years and was head of the pediatric liver transplant program. And they really did a tremendous amount of pioneering in intestinal transplant and pediatric liver transplant, split livers, and he became the head of that program. For the last 10 years, he's been the head of the transplant program in Seattle at the University of Washington. And I want to personally thank him for being with us today. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm going to take you through a, a little journey of intestinal transplants. Let's see if it, if it wants me to. There. Um, this is a picture of Dr. Starzl in his younger days. And um, I wanted to start with his, this picture because he actually is responsible for the development of intestinal transplant, as with many other things in transplantation. But it was actually uh, the opportunity to start intestinal transplantation that prompted me to stay in Pittsburgh. I had a fellowship waiting for me to do pediatric surgery in Philadelphia, and I gave it up to stay to do this, uh, this groundbreaking uh, uh, transplantation with, with him. So this is a, is a story of a, a team uh, that started with Starzl, so to speak. But in order to understand how or why we got to intestinal transplantation, I'd like to go back even further to this man. Um, Sir Peter Medwar, he's, uh, he was born in Brazil, but his mother was from uh, England. And they returned to the UK uh, just before the World War II. Uh, and he started medical school during that period of time. And uh, he was part of the research that was being done to study why um, certain skin grafts were taking in the victims of the bombing of London. Uh, they, were, they were using skin from the bombing victims that uh, that had died from the bombings and using the skin from those victims to cover the burns of the patients that had been burned. And some skin grafts had taken for a while and he was in charge with studying the reason why. Uh, those studies uh, took him to, uh, in the 50s, to this model of skin grafting uh, and the, the development of acquired, to uh, acquired immune tolerance to, to transplanted tissues where uh, skin from a, a dark rat transplanted to the light rat was used after ablation of the rat's immunocytes and then infusion of uh, bone marrow or spleen cells into the rat prior to transplantation. Uh, this was the first experiment of trying to manipulate the immune system in order to accept a skin graft. Prior to this, the understanding of the immune system was basically there to protect us from other things, but it was this idea to modify the immune system that really made the, uh, gave us the first stepping stone towards transplantation. Uh, this model of the rat was quickly transferred uh, to the clinical bone marrow transplant scenario uh, in the late 50s, uh, where E. Donald Thomas uh, accomplished the first bone marrow transplant, uh, I think it was in Tennessee. And then he moved to Seattle, where he established a, a major bone marrow transplant center. Uh, around the same time, though, uh, efforts at kidney transplantation uh, were successful, and then liver and, and heart. Uh, the issue of chimerism was always in, in the minds of the, the transplanters, but these were done without leukocyte chimerism, without HLA matching. And the specter of GVHD, which is graft-versus-host disease, which is the the disease caused by immunocytes that transfer with the graft, such as in bone marrow transplantation, that attack the recipient, uh, was, was uh, not there for the solid organ transplants. Nonetheless, during this period of the 50s, uh, certain important um, cornerstones were established for the success of any type of organ graft, which is immunosuppression in those days, azathioprine and prednisone, there was no cyclosporine organ preservation, tissue matching, and, of course, surgical technology, the ability to take these patients uh, and perform the operation with varying degrees of illness and, and complications. Uh, 
the initial uh, features of this was that rejection was a highly reversible uh, event. Uh, and this was, you know, you, you hear these stories. Uh, this, the, the first time they did this was they decided to do it in an elevator in Denver, Colorado, where a kidney recipient was rejecting, and uh, they were scratching their heads. Uh, I'm sure it happened a little different, but this is a little dramatic. And somebody said, well, you know, the bone marrow transplants give steroids when they have a rejection of the bone marrow graft. And uh, they said, well, let's give some steroids. And well, how much, 500? Uh, somebody else in the elevator said, no, a gram. Somebody else said two grams. So the, the, treat, the, the use of steroids has been ubiquitous since the beginning of transplant. And the various recipes to use it has been varied as well. The other thing about transplantation is that organs are inherently tolerogenic, as with happens with bone marrow. Many of the patients that get bone marrows eventually stop immunosuppressive management. But there are some patients, some few patients, that, uh, that receive solid organs that we've always known that we were able to stop their immunosuppression. When I was doing uh, my transplant fellowship in Pittsburgh, I was reviewing some charts uh, and would stumble across patients that were off. And uh, I would ask the nurse coordinators, what about this patient? He's not on immunosuppression. He said, oh, don't worry about him. He hasn't been on immunosuppression for years. These patients were sailing along even then with no real attention paid to them until later. Um, the, um, the first intestinal graft was actually done in the 60s in, in dogs. Uh, it was an experiment performed by Dr. Starzl. Uh, and the, uh, the purpose of this experiment uh, of uh, liver, stomach, intestine, pancreas was to see the various immunologic changes in the various parts of the graft uh, with a transplant. Uh, this was, paper was presented at the American Surgical Association. And one of the, the comments of the, uh, the surgeon that, that uh, critiqued this paper was, this was an, adverse, an adventure in search of adversity, and that he could have had an easier time if he just switched the dogs from table to table uh, because it was a surgery that really had no purpose. Interestingly, 30 years later, this would be the keystone operation for, that would begin the experience with intestinal transplantation. These were the first survivors of liver transplantation uh, in Denver. Uh, these patients were treated with uh, azathioprine and prednisone. Prior to these successes, there were a couple of dozen adult liver transplant recipients that, that did not survive and actually resulted in a moratorium, looking at what were the complicating factors that were impeding the success of liver transplantation. And, um, and that was, once they had a review of all those cases, they restarted the program with the pediatric cases. This is the transplant fellow uh, who, at the time in Denver, was helping Dr. Starzl. His name is Carl Groth. He went on to, to be the chief of the Karolinska Institute uh, in Stockholm and, and subsequently the chair of the Nobel Prize Committee. And he actually died recently, a, a few weeks ago. He passed away. Around this time, when we're achieving all these milestones in transplantation, uh, we were also achieving some milestones in the management of patients that had lost the use of their gut with the development of TPN by Judrick, uh, uh, reviewed here in 2004. But as you can see, over the course of many years, from the 1600s, there were various, sort, the various attempts to give something intravenously to replace or support uh, function in, in humans, uh, wine, blood, glucose, fat, uh, the development of uh, catheters, uh, the need for positive nitrogen balance, et cetera. All of this led to the successful development of TPN. So the, and, and when they did develop it, the indications for TPN in adults, these are old indications, short bowel syndrome for the variety of indications here, uh, loss of the gut due to thrombosis, radiation and arthritis, Crohn's, obstructive issues, complications after bypass surgery, and in children, congenital disorders, resulting in uh, uh, the non-existence of intestine, uh, abdominal disorders where the abdominal wall fails to close and the gut remains outside the body and then is lost uh, during that period, perinatal period, uh, volvulus, and other mucosal diseases, defects of the enterocyte where the enterocyte does not absorb uh, and the patients die quickly from uncontrollable diarrhea and similarly other disorders of absorption uh, and, and also motility, uh, such as pseudo-obstruction syndromes, congenital delayed onset, uh, 
uh, and secondary to other causes. Uh, all of these were, were indications for TPN, and these today are the standard indications for intestinal transplantation. Um, I showed a picture of Starzl and, and now of Richard Lillehei, who did uh, some of the first intestine transplants, um, because in those days, uh, we would just do it. We, you know, we had a problem, we had a challenge, uh, we had a certain background, experimental, and, and that was limited because we, we knew very little. And then certainly no clinical background to, to, to go on. And we went ahead and did it. So there was a, a boldness of, of, in terms of surgery and in terms of new innovative techniques that existed in those days. And, and he epitomized, he and Starzl, for intestine transplantation, they epitomized that, that boldness. As you can see here, the first cases of intestine transplantation uh, began more or less around the time that we were, we were trying to achieve liver and kidney and heart transplantation. You can see cases here done in Sao Paulo uh, and in Paris and then in Boston, New York, all isolated bowel segments, uh, sometimes uh, a living donor segment, and the survival was measured in days because we weren't really, we really did not have the, the right, uh, the various techniques of immune preservation and surgical techniques, but more importantly, we did not have the immunosuppressor regimens that could sustain this graft, and they failed. Um, then came the, this report of transplantation of multiple abdominal viscera uh, w that was reported in JAMA back in 1989. I actually met the recipient of this graft. Uh, she received uh, the, the multivisceral graft that was reported by Starzl experimentally in dogs um, 30 years before, uh, a liver, stomach, uh, bowel. Uh, we already knew at, that, at this time that the liver was protective of the kidneys if you transplant the liver plus the kidney. So it was felt that if you transplanted the liver together with the bowel, that the liver would be protective of the intestine. And that was attempted, again, with massive amounts of immunosuppression. Um, this recipient received, the, the donor was, uh, the organs were irradiated, the, the donor received anti-lymphocyte antibody. The recipient had total body radiation with uh, anti-lymphocyte antibodies, cyclosporin and uh, amurand and steroids. Uh, massive amount of immunosuppression to maintain this graft. And within uh, 93 days, this patient, uh, this patient presented, um, can't go back. Well, the other, the other picture next to that, that uh, image, uh, yeah. Uh, Perfect. Uh, thank you. The, you can see this image here. Uh, within 93 days, this patient developed a lymphoma, post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease, again, with the major imbalance of immunosuppression that this baby uh, needed in order to survive. So this and other cases in Pittsburgh and in, in the, uh, in internationally put a moratorium on this operation again uh, because it was, just wasn't feasible. Up until uh, the late 80s, there was only one survivor of the early 90s, there was only one survivor of intestinal graft uh, performed in Paris, isolated bowel. Uh, this is the recipient of that bowel uh, already going into her teen years. Um, uh, so she was the only survivor. So we were doing very poorly. Um, we needed better immune suppression. And then came tacrolimus uh, in, that, in these days called FK506. Uh, this is the historical survival of liver transplantation using the uh, azathioprine prednisone, the first survivors in Colorado that I showed you a picture of. And then cyclosporin came along and changed transplantation for almost overnight uh, with survival, great survival with all organs. And then in the early 90s, we introduced tacrolimus, FK506. That gave us a better survival, but better survival with less toxicity. And we felt that with this drug, we could potentially be successful with intestinal transplantation. Uh, and then uh, Grant um, in Canada uh, and his team developed a different operation of a liver, uh, of a bowel containing a liver, eliminating the stomach and the pancreas, which did make the, both the donor operation and the recipient operation very complex. And these intestine patients, they, you know, they, they are complicated patients to start with. And if you start with a complicated graft, you, you lose a few patients early on just from perioperative uh, 
surgical complications. But with this operation, it simplified the operation, uh, and he was able to achieve some success with cyclosporin. So uh, the, this ability to change the type of graft with intestine really changed the, the uh, technical expertise of, of transplantation in general, where we could, based on the, the, the super mesenteric artery here and celiac artery here, we could basically procure any type of organ from the abdominal cavity, uh, including organs that contain kidneys, for example, uh, because we would bring the aorta. So this, this is what we would call then the multiple phases of, of intestinal transplantation, where patients that suffered varying disorders, either short gut or short gut plus TPN-induced cholestasis, could receive various types of graft that fit the need. Um, prior to initiating intestine transplantation, we used this model of multivisceral grafting for this operation called the, the cluster operation. We envisioned the, the abdominal graft as a cluster of grapes where we could remove one grape or a, a certain number of grapes in order to form the, the graft that the patient needed. These patients all had upper abdominal malignancies, neuroendocrine tumors that had metastasized to the liver that were not transplant candidates for a regular liver transplant because they required removal of the pancreas and the stomach. So these patients had upper abdominal accentuation, for example, where we remove the stomach, pancreas, duodenum, and liver, and replacement with this organ. This allowed us to use a new operation and also an, uh, allowed us to use a new drug, tacrolimus, and we were able to monitor this segment of intestine with this new drug, and we were very impressed with how that segment of bowel uh, was doing. So now we went on to really perfect the multivisceral type of procurement where, yes, we can take an isolated bowel, for an isolated bowel recipient, or <clears throat> leave the bowel in place uh, with the duodenum, <clears throat> simplifying the procurement, and transplant a liver bowel or a pancreas bowel, uh, et cetera. All these graphs, uh, in terms of solid organs, you need arterialization, inflow of arterial blood, here in this case the supermesenteric artery, <clears throat> and venous drainage, the outflow of blood. You need that for any type of organ graft. And the outflow of blood can be established in the isolated bowel recipient to the patient's native portal vein or to the vena cava. <clears throat> we, we tend to do it more simply to the vena cava because we have not demonstrated a benefit to draining this type of graft into the portal vein. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> this is a, a picture showing the interposition graft. We, we bring back uh, vein and arterial grafts from the donor and plug those into the patient's vena cava and aorta and use those as extension grafts to the new uh, organ. Here is an isolated bowel graft in the back bench in the ice. Uh, here is the artery and here is the vein waiting for implantation into those extension grafts that I showed just a little while ago. As I suggested, the liver bowel graft has now morphed into a different type of graft. Um, with the graft that was introduced by Grant, we needed to do a biliary reconstruction because we had removed that whole duodenum and um, and biliary drainage, and that resulted in and of itself in biliary complications. So we simplified the procurement by maintaining the duodenum uh, and the intestine in continuity with the hepatic hilus. Uh, the procurement of these organs are, is very simple today, and the implantation also has been much simplified because of this technique. Here you see a patient ready for that type of graft where we have removed the liver a clamp is placed on the vena cava. This is the vena cava of the recipient. Uh, we do a, a portal caval shunt. The, all the, the portal venous drainage of the native residual stomach or pancreas of the patient is shunted into the vena cava, and that remains. And then the new graft, which contains the liver and the bowel and its own portal vein and its own biliary system, is implanted into the, the hepatic venous drainage to the vena cava here. The diaphragm is here. The heart is there and the, an aortic graft is brought from below to arterialize the new graft. Uh, this can be done by maintaining the patient's own duodenum and pancreas as seen here. Here is that native portal caval shunt from the patient's own portal vein. Or we can remove the entire abdominal contents of the recipient and transplant uh, a multivisceral graft. Here we see uh, an abdomen completely devoid of all the abdominal organs, 
the kidneys are there, a clamp in the, the uh, hepatic veins, the vena cava is here, and the aorta is here. So that would be a complete accentuation and, again, replacement by the liver, stomach, duodenum, and pancreas. Uh, sometimes we, we have patients that have intestinal failure, they need an intestine, but their livers are working very well, they still need a pancreas or a duodenum because of motility disorders, for example, nothing works in that patient. So we will preserve the liver and transplant a multivisceral graft that just has the intestinal components. That would be stomach, duodenum, pancreas, and small bowel. And you can see here they're ready for implantation, and here is the donor stomach, duodenum, pancreas, and small bowel, and with this, the liver remaining in this recipient. So you see that we've, we've the, 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 the operation can change the painting on the needs of the patient. We do living donor grafts as well, uh, it, distal ileum, four feet of bowel. If you transplant four feet of bowel either from a do living donor or, in some cases, we can reduce the intestine in a cadaveric donor. If you transplant four feet of bowel, we can take that patient of total parental nutrition. The advantages of doing living donors, however, has not been demonstrated in terms of survival or any immunologic advantage. So we are not, uh, there, there really presently is no program that is heavy on doing living donor segments. We can also do, though, that the program that was advocating this in Chicago was doing uh, living donor intestine and taking a segment of left, left lateral lobe of the donor to do it so that they can do a liver intestine uh, in pediatric patients. Uh, again, if you recall, the intestine can damage the, the, um, the liver because from the, 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 the need for TPN can damage the liver and make it cholestatic. Redu we can reduce these grafts, as you can see here. We can take uh, off the right lobe, remove stomach, remove a lot of bowel. All we need is four feet, and thereby transplant a smaller graft into a pediatric patient and get them off TPN. And what this addresses, of course, is pediatric patients, they're small, and there's a range of potential donors, and we, we, the, the, the mortality waiting for just the right size donor in those recipients was very high, so we went on to start reducing these grafts, as is done with the liver. And you see here a, a reduced uh, liver uh, intestine uh, transplant graft ready for implantation. Um, because of this problem with big grafts and, in, and sometimes inability to transplant uh, to close the abdominal cavity, Miami introduced transplantation of the abdominal wall. This, this is a, a graft that's based on vascularization using the donor iliac artery and veins implanted into the recipient iliacs and, of course, the inferior epigastrics that go to the, the rectus abdominal uh, tissue. Um, this type of graft is infrequently used, but it was actually one of the first successful compos composite tissue grafts used worldwide. Today, composite tissue grafting is becoming more uh, known because of the face transplant or the arm or the leg transplant, but this was actually the first type of composite tissue transplant that was done successfully. As you can see here is, here is the, the, donor, the donor graft that is being implanted. You can see the midline incision from the donor operation. The donor for this graft is the same donor for the abdominal wall. Um, and uh, here is the, the graft with the iliac uh, arteries that are extending into it, again, prior to implantation in the recipient. Uh, we can also obviate transplanting all this composite tissue by just bringing back rectus fascia and using that as a biological fascia to maintain the containment of the abdominal wall in these cases that we can't bring together. Eventually, some of these edges will come together or a skin graft can be placed on this patient. Transplantation of the small bowel. Well, initially when we were transplanting the small bowel, we were also trying to include the colon because many of these patients, uh, it was difficult to get them off TPN. It was felt that leaving the allograft colon in place as well would help us do that. But we encountered a lot of infections. Uh, here is a, a case of a small bowel that still contained the large intestine uh, that was being transplanted. The Miami group and the French group continued on with their efforts to make, make it successful, and they actually did. They saw their survival uh, had improved dramatically. Here is colon inclusion, here is no colon, or at least no difference in, no significant difference in survival. So for certain indications, such as Hirschsprung's disease, where you may want to later do a pull-through, uh, 
a colon transplant may be indicated. Now, the survival initially was great uh, back in the early 90s, and we were very happy with the outcome. But gradually, over time, this is in years, we saw that survival was decreasing because, again, rejection of the graft was very common, both early rejection and later rejection. And also, because of the need for such high levels of immunosuppression, it was also common to see toxicity and infection in these cases. So again, these patients remain very complex, complicated to treat. This is a stoma. We always leave a stoma uh, to monitor the graft uh, immediately after transplant. Here you see a very angry looking stoma. Uh, this patient required endorectomy because of severe acute rejection. You can see here the endoscopy of this patient where the entire mucosa of the intestine has been lost. The mucosa is the target, uh, the immunologic target for rejection. And when you have severe rejection, you lose that immunologic, uh, that superficial lining. If you maintain crypts in a bowel that's severely rejected, you could potentially regenerate this superficial lining. But if you lose the crypt, it will not regenerate, and the patient, this bowel will shrivel down and require removal in the future. Uh, here, histologically, you can see normal, happy villi and goblet cells and nice crypts. Here you see the, the targeting of the crypts as the source for infection, lymphocytes, apoptosis of crypt cells, and here loss once you lose these crypts, eventually you lose the villi, uh, and then you've, you've sloughed the bowel, so to speak. Other than that, uh, because these patients needed a lot of immunosuppression, PTLD was very common, about 30% incidence of PTLD compared to about five, less than 5% incidence with other organs, for example. The allograft was a very common source for PTLD. This patient presented with herpes and stomatitis, her tongue looked a little funny. We biopsied the tongue, and she had PTLD of the tongue. So it was a very aggressive disease that we were seeing with, with these patients. This actually prompted the first uh, trials of monitoring EBV-induced uh, infection that eventually in these patients led to PTLD with EBV-PCR. Uh, and monitoring this disease by that allowed us to pick up that first blip in the infectious phase and introduce antiviral therapy and minimize immunosuppression at that time. And with that strategy, we were able to improve survival uh, because we were able to pick up EBV infection before it became PTLD. But our immunosuppressive management was still the same. So the incidence of infection was still the same. Our survival improved a little bit because these patients were not developing PTLD. Graft versus host disease was, has always been a constant fear with intestine transplants. And as you can see here, these are classic lesions of GVHD blisters, the classic histologic picture, lymphocytes, apoptosis of the basilar cells. And you know, when we first started seeing this, we were very scared. We, of course, immediately retreated to, well, how did the hematologists treat this? And they treated with more immune suppression. And historically, the management of PTLE has always been poor with solid organs because we eventually end up giving them more immune suppression. This patient and others that presented at the time allowed us to test the theory by Starzl that minimizing immunosuppression could be a better management, and we did. We minimized the immunosuppression in this patient. Now, why did we do that? Because with bone marrow, you have an immune, uh, the immune system, the new bone marrow, is pretty much the, the, the dominant graft. There's very little recipient marrow, so you really have to suppress that. Where solid organ, there's an imbalance between the recipient immune system and the donor immune system. And it's the, the effect of minimizing immunos immunosuppression that allows the recipient's immune system to elevate itself and then balance out. So that's the standard management today for most solid organs and, the, and uh, particularly for the intestine. Now, causes of death in these intestines, rejection really is the main cause. Uh, however, it's rejection that leads to a cascade of other problems that lead to multi-system organ failure. So as with other organs, when you look for cause of death with any graft, it's difficult to tease out. But essentially, it is about rejection. It is about toxicity. And it is about infection. Um, we used to think that uh, with transplant, graft versus host disease was caused with all these donor immunocytes that went to the, the host and caused the disease. We documented a huge amount of donor cells in the peripheral blood of these recipients in the early recipients in the 90s, where we could detect 
up to 10% of donor cells in the periphery that gradually disappeared. Today, any recipient of small bile, we can detect up to 30, 40% donor cells in the peripheral blood of those recipients early on at the transplant. These cells would disappear. We never knew where they went, but it, essentially they go everywhere. Uh, and we believe at this point that these two armies of immunocytes under the control of immunosuppression allow for some balance for acceptance of the graft and then uh, prevention of GVHD and eventually uh, longer term acceptance. And it's this balance of rejection, host versus graft and graft versus host, that with immunosuppression will eventually lead to the need for less immunosuppression and a good balance of and long term survival. With intestine, uh, there's, a, there's, a different, uh, there's a different therapeutic window as compared to the liver. The liver is very tolerogenic. We love the liver because we can do anything with the liver. You can give them steroids for a week and they'll do fine. Uh, but with the intestine, no. So the therapeutic window with the liver is very wide. A lot of things can happen. You can stop immunosuppression in a liver recipient that comes in with complications and not worry about it for a week or two. But with the intestine, the therapeutic window between infection and rejection is very small. As you can see here, this balance of having it just right to then too much immunosuppression and GVHD, too much uh, with post-transplant lymphoma or too little with rejection, it was a very fine line that we were walking. And it had to do with tacrolimus levels, but it mostly had to do with what happens with any, immune, any transplant recipient where you start with a dose, you want a level, and then within a couple of weeks, you really have to individualize to see what that patient is doing uh, in terms of their immune system. There is a hierarchy of organ susceptibility to rejection with the bowel, the ileum being the most susceptible. Uh, and it's very, interestingly, it's very similar to the, uh, the other organs, other organs that we transplant. But I just wanted to show you with the the, the ileum rejects with a higher frequency with the, than the jejunum. That's why we leave a stoma of ileum. And most of the times when there's rejection, we could diagnose it, but diagnose it by biopsying the ileum. Sometimes if the patient is sick enough and the ileum is normal, we will do an upper endoscopy and be able to diagnose rejection by looking at the jejunum. But rarely does the large bowel reject. Rarely does the stomach reject. Uh, this hierarchy is similar to what we see with the lung and the skin. Uh, difficult organs to transplant similar to the bowel when compared to other organs. And the, a commonality that these have is that these tissues are exposed, exposed to environmental antigens and thus more susceptible to organs. These tissues have a well-developed innate immune defense system. Not the acquired, it's the innate, something that, that, is, that is really gaining uh, some uh, traction in terms of our understanding of the immune system. And yes, today we believe that we're, when we look at a graft, we need to think of the innate immune system. We also need to think of the enterocyte uh, as an antigen-presenting cell, which is what it is. Um, the innate immune system are intestinal passenger cells. Um, it, was, it was suggested that these cells that transfer to the, to the, to the recipient we're less tolerogenic, but I, I don't think that that's holding out clinically. But we know that these cells do transfer and are replaced by donor immunocytes. Um, thoughts on uh, innate and adaptive immunity have a lot to do with toll-like receptors. And um, the, the inflammatory signals that occur with ischemia reperfusion, uh, the intestinal epithelium being the antigen uh, presenting cell, uh, the presence of bacterial products and that also can stimulate the toll-like receptors. The, again, the enterocyte recognizing these uh, antigens uh, and the associated lymphocytes, the special associated lymphocytes that we see in, in, in the intestine. This will lead to, uh, to mobilization of the effector cell and then to graft rejection. So this is a process that I think can be translated perhaps to the liver in a different way, but with the intestine, since we've given a lot of thought to this relationship, it's become uh, very uh, important in terms of what to do with the immunosuppression. As you can see here, uh, examples, uh, experimental examples of uh, absences of key factors that impact toll-like receptors can pro prolong survival of intestinal grafts. 
ischemia reperfusion triggers activation of toll-like receptors and participation of TLF4 is related to intestinal transplant receptors uh, uh, rejection and then mutation of NOD2, uh, which encodes micro microbial sensors and gut inflammation also associated with poor outcome after intestinal transplantation. Other players, ischemia reperfusion, again, with intestine and with many other organs can uh, be correlated with rejection, TNF-alpha, and, and things that improve TNF-alpha <coughs> or things that improve, uh, that impact T lymphocytes, such as antithymocyclobulin, all can impact this damage uh, that occurs with uh, uh, ischemia and perfusion of the intestinal graft. So we believe that these factors really are the factors that are are promoting this graft as a graft that has a high rejection rate. Uh, experimentally, as we can see, the intestine is accepted better after a liver transplant, so the liver has always had a protective effect of the intestine, and we've known that rejection is less common with the multivisceral or liver bowel grafts than when compared with the isolated graft. And in those combined liver, living donor combined liver bowel cases, done by Benedetti in Chicago, none of the patients experienced any episode of rejection. Uh, this is from the intestinal transplant registry showing how the liver containing grafts have a better survival than the isolated intestinal grafts. So again, intestine, uh, liver containing grafts are, have an important protective effect. As far as chimerism and donor bone marrow and augmenting donor bone marrow by, by bringing back uh, the vertebral columns of donors, for example, we would prepare the, the bone marrow from those vertebral columns and give it to the recipient. We could never really show that chimerism uh, helped those, those patients uh, clinically, but there has been some evidence of this combination effect uh, improving uh, some uh, survival experimentally. High-dose steroids. We've eliminated high-dose steroids for early after transplant for many organs, the liver especially, but the intestine oddly enough, where we needed, we thought we needed more immune suppression, was the first organ that we started using less steroids for or eliminated steroids. And, and then based on experiments that showed that high-dose steroids could uh, change the tolerance factor in mice, and clinically, steroid-free pediatric liver transplants were more likely to develop a T helper suppressor ratio 2 profile and become tolerant. And that's something that was observed in Pittsburgh as well. This is an experimental uh, rat uh, intestinal transplant model comparing donor-specific blood transfusions with or without steroids uh, here to uh, allogeneic control and steroid induction. And as you can see here, steroids had a, a bad effect as far as survival with these grafts. The amount of calcium neuroinhibitor has also been uh, uh, correlated with less tolerance or less uh, uh, rejection-free survival. As you can see here in this experiment, uh, survival in days, uh, the development of Tregs associated with gradually increasing levels of cyclosporin, no Tregs, gradually decreasing levels of cyclosporin, no Tregs. Most immunosuppressive weaning protocols today use this as a cornerstone of their understand for their understanding that if you go from twice a day tacrolimus to once a day, to every other day, to Monday, Wednesday, Friday, the, this is the type of strategy that will facilitate acceptance of this, of this graph long term. We were able then to use all this information and introduce a new paradigm of immunosuppression using anti-lymphocyte globulin uh, uh, early, before the graft is implanted. The reason for doing that is we would impact all of these cells that are leaving the graft, that are becoming activated, if we've given this do recipient anti-lymphocyte globulin, these cells that have been primed, when they, they interact with the, the host immune system, these host immune cells would, uh, would, be, uh, would destroy themselves, would suffer apoptosis. So our present protocol for most transplants, and particularly intestine, is lymphoid depletion pretreatment before the graft goes in, and then minimal immune suppression, steroids only in the setting of, of uh, rejection, but minimal immune suppression, what does that mean? For uh, in the 90s, we were running tacrolimus levels around 20 for all organs. And then for the intestine, we said, well, we need more because it rejects more, 20 to 25. Today, 
uh, the intestine was actually the organ that introduced minimal tacrolimus dosing. We went from running levels of 15 to 20 to running levels of 10 or less. And this, based on this, uh, this theory. So with this theory, with this uh, clinical trial, we saw, uh, w which, which included thymoglobin and compared to other protocols of immune suppression, uh, we saw less PTLD because these patients were exposed to a, less, a lower burden of overall immune suppression. We, lost, we saw less CMV as well, as you can see here, compared to the other protocols. And we saw much better survival. As you can see here, the early survival was great. But again, what's going to happen here long term? The long term survival for these cohort of patients that re receive this type of pretreatment and minimal immune suppression has been much better than, uh, than before and comparable to liver transplantation alone. This is a boy who received an isolated bowel and pancreas transplant uh, with this protocol. Uh, he developed an early EBV infection within a, couple of, within a couple of months, manifested by fever and a high PCR. We immediately minimized his immunosuppression. And presently, uh, this is in his hi uh, high school graduation party, uh, and he presently finished college and uh, is an engineer, and he's taking tacrolimus once a day, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, uh, and he still has his graft. This is also serves as my quality of life after transplant picture. You know, he's in his tux, he's at a party, he's got his gal at his arm. Uh, I always say that if my patient's quality of life is better than mine, then we've achieved something. So <laughs> that's, that's part of my journey. So where do we stand? Uh, are we ready for this? I'd like to buy a bowel. Uh, that's, what, that's what Glenn asked me this morning, driving in. Yeah, can we buy bowels? Uh, no, not really. Um, but going back to historical, our survival, we were really worried. Are we doing the right thing? But those patients that didn't receive a transplant that were suffering complications of TPN, their one-year survival was 30%. So we knew that we were doing better than no transplant, but, but we also knew that we had a big problem with, with these patients. Um, so we got together. This is Ed Barksdale, a pediatric surgeon mm -hmm. in Pittsburgh, and Sam Kokosch, uh, GI hepatologist, myself. Uh, we got together, uh, this is us now in our older days, we were much younger when we started this, but we got together with them because I did not, I did not know how to take care of these patients. My focus was doing the transplant, let's put the grafts in. We were receiving patients from all over the country with intestinal failure. I needed help managing these patients. So this actually generated a, an important collaboration in order to manage them better and Quickly enough, within a few years, we were actually getting some patients off TPN, and they didn't need a transplant. We were very surprised with that, with this better management. So this actually started the first effort of intestinal rehabilitation, which has been the legacy of intestinal transplantation. Yes, we can do bowel transplants better, but the legacy of intestinal transplant was the formation of this type of management with patient-focused care, uh, with uh, various evaluations and multidisciplinary care, transplant as an option, and other surgeries and research. So this is the, 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 the paradigm that we look for. And when we see a patient, these are the focuses, uh, maintain growth and development, optimize bowel function, prevent complications, manage complications, feeding therapy. A lot of these patients were referred to us that had never eaten because it wouldn't do them any good, so why, why eat? And there were several cases that we transplanted successfully and that wouldn't eat still after transplant. And to this day, these are adults now, and they still will not put food in their mouth. They are maintained with feeding, with feeding tubes. Uh, immunizations and coordination of care, family support, all of these things are important in terms of intestinal rehab, diagnostic evaluations, nutritional support. Restorative surgical intervention is key. A lot of these patients have permanent stomas. Well, they, sometimes they have 10 centimeters of bowel or 10 inches. It's important to do that connection. They, they may have their entire colon. Uh, if they do develop liver failure and they have a stoma, the complications of the stoma are going to be horrible because the portal hypertension has nowhere to decompress except to the skin. So it makes a lot of sense to close those stomas. Th simple things have developed over this course uh, of years. Ethanol blocks to prevent sepsis has been a major, major factor in improvement in, in survival. And new lipid management strategies, the introduction of omega event in patients uh, actually has improved liver function, 
here noted in all these patients that, that we introduced it to uh, and prevented liver disease. Uh, other, other surgical uh, um, fixes, a step procedure, a bowel lengthening, the Bianchi procedure. These days, uh, bowel lengthening is a step procedure where you take dilated bowel and you staple, 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 and eventually do like an accordion extension of the bowel. That has also resulted in patients being able to come off uh, TPN. The development of consortium to study these patients uh, was an outcome of, of this, uh, th these various intestinal symposiums that we have. Uh, this uh, report looks at 272 patients of this consortium. And you look here, of these patients, uh, how many died without a transplant, how many alive, not transplanted, how many have achieved enteral autonomy today. This, these are the successes of a, of a good intestinal rehabilitation center. Uh, the impact at sick kids in, uh, in Toronto, you can see here before intestinal rehab, early and then late, you can see here liver failure, almost non-existent. Uh, and then subsequently, patients uh, that don't need to be listed for transplant, removed from the list. Transplantation has actually gone down, the need for intestine transplant, and then death prior to transplant has also gone down. So intestinal rehabilitation is great. Here you see a UNOS chart showing the mortality of intestinal, of various types of grats waiting. Intestinal transplant mortality was very high. It has dropped significantly because these patients tolerate uh, uh, longer term. So at the end of the day, this is still true. Most patients with intestinal transplant can be rehabilitated without the need for intestinal transplantation. I never thought I'd say that, but I am saying that. Conclusion, parental nutrition provided by an expert center remains the preferred treatment. Uh, indications for intestinal transplant, though, are you're running out of IV access, recurrent life-threatening sepsis, progressive liver failure, they, they would need a liver, of course, fatal conditions, ultra-short bowel, or a patient with no bowel. They, they have a, <clears throat> a duodenostomy and they have no colon. <clears throat> Extreme shortcut is still an indication for early transplant, and then poor quality of life or dissatisfaction with TPN. Number of transplants performed worldwide, almost 3,000. Active centers, 35. These, these are the breakdowns in the various types <clears throat> of graphs. This is the gender, males and females, and the ages, greater than 18 and uh, 13 to 18 and 1 to 3 and less than 1 year old. So it's still a very active field. But um, it's very hard to do so. Most centers are not doing them. Uh, <clears throat> adults, the various type of grafts you can see here, adults require less of the liver bowel combination because <clears throat> they usually use their bowel as adults. <clears throat> Children require more of the liver bowel combination because they lose their bowel early and they develop TPN complications early as well. Various indications in children, most commonly ne necrotizing or colitis, gastroschisis, and volvulus, <coughs> atresias and motility disorders <coughs> in adults, bowel ischemia from thrombotic disorders, Crohn's disease and trauma, and then motility disorders are also more common. <coughs> Excuse me. The incidence of intestinal transplantation is dropping, mainly in children, as you can see here, but also in adults, again, because we can manage them better and we can get them off TPN. <coughs> and the pre-transplant status of these patients also, similarly, we're bringing in more patients from home for their transplant versus before, where most patients were uh, in hospital, both in adults and, and children. <coughs> transplant type has layered out between the various small bowel, small bowel liver, multivisceral, and modified multivisceral. Uh, it's always ideal, even though the liver is protective of the bowel, it is always better to do an isolated bowel because we don't have enough livers to go around, so it's better to keep those for the isolated bowel patients. And patient survival by era, we are doing better, but again, they're, they're overall, in certain centers have a much better survival, but overall, when you take the entire registry data, uh, it's not as good as you might expect. But it is getting better by era because we have better management, better management of the patient, better perioperative management, and better immunosuppressive management with the ability to minimize uh, immunosuppression and here you can see that the, the liver-containing grafts do have a better long-term survival still than the isolated uh, bowel grafts. Mm -hmm.
Um, so I will, uh, we're almost finished. I, I want to leave a little time for questions, uh, but I do want to conclude that intestinal transplant can be life-saving in well-indicated patients. Um, I have a couple of survival slides, uh, uh, um, uh, quality of life slides that suggest that intestinal transplant uh, does provide some good quality of life. Patients do get employed and stay active after intestine transplant, and uh, the long-term health seems to be better with intestinal uh, failure if they get a bowel than if they re re receive, than if they remain on total parenteral nutrition. This is my team picture. This is the, the pediatric team at Seattle Children's. Uh, team is very important, multivisceral teams, multivisceral rehab, transplantation. The team approach is critical for survival of these patients. And here's a picture of Starzl uh, at a reunion. Uh, this patient uh, received uh, an intestine. She, she got a liver transplant for biliary atresia, had a Ruy limb, and then she suffered a volvulus with an internal hernia as an adolescent, lost her entire gut. We gave her a second transplant, an intestine transplant, and uh, she got married, had baby, had, uh, she now has two babies. So you can have babies after an intestinal transplant. And that's an important conclusion as well, you might say. She was our first recipient of intestinal transplantation back in 18, 1989. You might say she's the patient I gave up my pediatric surgery fellowship for uh, because we started with her. And I would like to leave you with these words, T.S. Eliot. Uh, why? Because, you know, this road, this journey has taken us to success with intestinal transplant. But again, the biggest success is not having to do intestinal transplant. I never thought that we would we would be at this stage, but we are, and it's a happy situation. But this is where we're at, and, and I kind of say this sometimes for him because this is where he might be. There is only the trying. The rest is not our business. Just keep trying. Do what you can, but don't stop, and particularly don't stop at that sign that says success. Run that light. Run that light. So I always have that in mind when, when I'm telling my, asking myself, where do I go now? <laughs> Let's just run this light. Thank you very much for your attention. So it, it, uh, yes and no. Actually, we, we have never achieved no immunosuppression with an intestinal transplant recipient. We have been able to minimize significantly. I think Kareem, though, may have in a couple of adults, but it's very dangerous, very dangerous. Um, I don't think that our knowledge of how to detect whether they're tolerant or not is, is even close. I can't detect it in the clinic, for example. It's all trial and error. And when you err on an intestine, you lose the bowel, you can lose the patient. With the other organs, the same strategy has resulted, again, minimal immunosuppression, but has resulted in a higher frequency of, of being able to come off immunosuppression. Having said that, with the liver, which is the most tolerogenic organ uh, that we say, whatever immunosuppression we use in those patients today, if you took all your recipients of liver and entered them into a weaning protocol, Almost a third of them could be minimized, and many of them could come off immunosuppression, whatever you did with them. We know that. The question is how to achieve that on a regular basis and sooner, and, and to, to develop a true tolerogenic protocol. We have not done that. We have not done that. The Japanese thought they did, using living donors and, and ATG, but they really haven't. Sure. So operational tolerance versus true tolerance. And uh, again, over the course of my, my years in Pittsburgh, um, we, 
those accidental patients that I saw in the in reviewing charts when I was a fellow, that we took it a step further and, and actually when we saw that tacrolimus worked so well without steroids, we went back and started taking everybody off steroids. So tacrolimus actually introduced a steroid-free or minimal steroid regimens. Uh, and then we went further. We started minimizing these patients as well uh, in a structured fashion. And by the time I left Pittsburgh, we had about 50 patients off immunosuppression in a very well-structured uh, regimen. True, it's operational tolerance. We really don't understand it. Yes, if you would give them a kidney, they would reject that kidney, so they do need to be immunosuppressed. Uh, I think some of the protocols that are using uh, living donor segments, kidneys or, or liver segments, and are using uh, living a, a bone marrow from the living donor prior to transplant, that's the opportunity that you may have clinically to detect whether they would be tolerant. Yes? Yeah, um, I personally think Campath is a step back. Uh, it's a very funny drug, uh, very hard to to work with, I think. And when it was used fairly extensively in Miami, it was done with a lot of other things going on. So you can never really tease out that isolated use of Campath. So I, I don't think that Campath has demonstrated any <clears throat> anything better than ATG, for example. Um, and um, so that's, that's as much as I can say about Campath. I don't, I don't think there's a particularly new drug coming along that, uh, that might uh, replace what we have now as far as tolerance induction. I do think that there are, there are some trials that are, that are about to start using conditioning, preconditioning with, with uh, ATG uh, and, and other uh, drugs such as um, um, Bacilixumab and ripamycin that, that might have some promise, but I, 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 I think it's the preconditioning factor that, that has the most likelihood of having an impact. And that's where we began with this. These, these patients are quickly preconditioned with ATG prior to implantation of the graft, which we never did. Um, you know, the prior to, uh, you know, deceased donor transplantation, which began in around the 60s, uh, mid or late 60s, um, that changed the immunosuppression protocols because you had to, you, you couldn't pretreat. Prior to that, all the living donors, they were being pretreated with uh, irradiation or, or, or a duct ligation or duct drainage of lymphocytes or, or sarcophosphamide or other drugs. They, they were all getting some sort of pretreatment. And it was deceased donor transplantation that changed that overnight. So now we're kind of going back to that pretreatment regimen. Yes. Yeah. So th these are blue ribbon donors, all of them. Um, minimal downtime, or which is cardiac arrest time in the donor. We always ascribe elevated liver functions in the donor, 200, 300, 400 range, as oh, these organs took a hit, an ischemic hit. Uh, and if the liver took an ischemic hit, then the bowel certainly took an ischemic hit. So we, we try to avoid uh, donors that have had high enzyme elevation. If they're on more than one presser, uh, we also avoid that. It, it's almost akin to a donor that you might consider for a split. If you consider, a, and those are, again, blue ribbon donors, uh, if you would use the same algorithm for donor selection for a bowel, you'd probably be very close. Yeah. Well, we're, we, as you know, when we're in the middle of the night, when we're half asleep, we're very good historians. <laughs> yeah, well, what about this? Uh, yeah, I wish I've been known to accept organs and then wake up in the morning. What? We're getting a liver? <laughs> um, so, the, um, so we try to do a good history because, in, in fact, it isn't there. And, um, and we, again, we shy away from donors that, that had been on TPN and enteral nutrition, Down syndrome patients, a lot of institutionalized patients, uh, 
that you really don't know if they've had a good use of their gut. Having said that, uh, an important population for these graphs is the neonate, um, where you know we we don't really use many neonatal liver isolated livers because of the high incidence of vascular complications. But a liver bowel is it's a perfect graph, and the, a simple detail like was it a term baby, and did the baby go home and come back with a problem? Those are the two key questions when deciding whether or not to do, use a graph like that. If they never went home, we never want to, we, we don't look at them. Yes. So, you know, the, again, the legacy of intestinal rehabilitation is a very strong one. And there are many centers that are developing intestinal rehabilitation centers uh, without having an intestine transplant center uh, program. And, and I think that's not unreasonable uh, because these patients are complicated. They do come back if they're transplanted elsewhere. And you know what? When they come back and they have a problem, they become an intestinal failure patient because they can't use their gut, they need lines, they need antibiotics, they need procedures. So that's why when we were failing with intestinal rehab, that's why it became important for me to learn how to manage intestinal failure. So I think developing one, regardless of whether you have a program or not, is important. And then also, when in the day we developed intestinal transplant, it, it was the pie in the sky. You know, we, we were always like, well, what's the next pie in the sky? It was intestinal transplants. Now, why? Because a program needs to, in order to be a program like Pittsburgh was in those days, it needed to innovate constantly. Cyclosporin, tacrolimus, multivisceral transplants, intestinal transplantation. Uh, all of these were, were, were programs that maintained um, the engine of clinical care and research and clinical innovation and research. Uh, and I can tell you that it's, it saved the liver transplant program at the Seattle, Seattle Children's because it was at a time when we weren't doing living donors. Dr. Starzl had a thing about it. Uh, and a lot of patients were being referred to Chicago for living donors. We were losing a lot of volume to it. And when we developed this, it, it just kind of captured everything again. Why? Because the, the referring docs really understood that they needed to send their patients to where there was expertise and growing expertise. So this, this developing centers like this allows for that as well. What is delayed graft function in an intestinal graft? And how is it manifested or is it that way? Is it an alternative to it? So, so that, that's a great question. I, I, um, I kind of, at, at one point in time, I. I had a thought, you know, you know, this is like putting in a kidney. Um, you know, it's isolated bowel, so you know, pop it in, and and uh, then it, it it dawned on me that you know, intestine failure is kind of like renal failure, the dialysis TPN, and when you put in a kidney, it makes urine right away, get them off dialysis. So I started as soon as I put the bowel in, I they never got TPN again. I started feeding into. We always leave a, a leave a feeding tube, and um, our mantra is feed the bowel and feed the patient. So the bowel needs nutrition immediately in order to recover from ischemia reperfusion, for example. Um, and again, most of these isolated bowel patients had a little bit of padding on them so they could tolerate poor nutrition, let's say, for a couple of weeks. But so having said that, it was my best guess. I don't know. We don't know. We, we don't have a, a blood. We don't have a creatinine, for example, for the bowel. Um, we only have. Uh, functional things like loose stools. Uh, if, if they can, if, if you're having trouble controlling their stools, that bowel is not working, either because it's not absorbing or because the motility is, is wrong. And it is reflected in the recipient, but it takes a while for, the, for them to develop the parameters, the laboratory parameters and the clinical parameters of weight loss for you to say it's not working. And this, this becomes more of an issue in chronic rejection 
where they come in with intermittent obstruction, intermittent diarrhea, they're losing weight, and you have to do a structural assessment, biopsies, but you don't really have a good functional assay that'll tell you, well, this bowel has dropped below the threshold that we have to take it out. Having said that, at the University of Washington, one of my constant observations is that we do not know how to manage enteral feeds. On a regular medical floor or surgical floor, we put patients on tube feeds, and the next thing you know, they have a rectal tube in them because they have diarrhea, and the rectal tube is in. Oh, what, what, what about the nutrition? Oh, it's perfect. They're tolerating tube feeds fantastically. They're not tolerating tube feeds. And, and that's a routine. You go today on your units, on your floors, you will see that. So again, this, this, this experience, this knowledge has given us that, that sense of, of these type of nutritional supports with enteral feeds and when we think it's not working. I, th I, I think we revisit it all the time, but we, 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 we still have the same bullet points. It's just a matter of how, like, liver dysfunction or liver failure, whether you rec can recover that patient from liver failure. We, we have. We have pa accepted patients in jaundice, uh, sick, into an ICU setting. I, I, I don't even want to say we. Simon Horsland has, and placed them on this special TPN regimen and recovered their liver. They still have a fibrotic liver, but it allows a little time to see if that 30 centimeters of bowel can be used. And he's been able to demonstrate that it has. But again, these are, you know, the patient population is still small. The end number is still small. The wins are there, um, and they're, they're, we're seeing them more often. So I, I don't think that we have formally said, now this is the indication, but as you can see from the drop in number of patients listed and transplanted, I think we're practicing it already. I don't know. That's a, that's a good question. Uh, I, I know that when we do intestinal transplantation in somebody with a fibrotic liver, uh, they still stay fibrotic. Uh, so, which, which is curious because you know, we, 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 which brings up the, the point where intestinal failure is a syndrome. It's, it's not just, it's not that you've lost your function of the intestine. There are other things. There's gastric dysmotility, pancreatic dysfunction, biliary dysfunction. So we have had patients where we've successfully put in a bowel, taken them off TPN, and they still have evidence of intestinal failure because they still have gastric dysmotility, they can still get pancreatitis on and off, may have abnormal liver functions, and their fibrosis does not go away. Well, great. It's nice being here. Thank you very much.